This whole idea of the uh, VRSP, what we've been talking about there, is a process and approach you as Christians, us as a church, are supposed to approach the world, approach life. Visibility. Can't do anything if people don't know you're there. So we need vis visibility, and we talked about it last week. Visibility in the right context. That's very, very important. Visibility God's way. Talked about relationship. Yeah, if we're out there visible as God's loving people, loving the world as God has loved, then relationships are going to be the next thing. But then what? Well, consider this. Jesus final lesson before he's put on a cross. It must be pretty important if this comes down to the final lesson he's going to teach his closest disciples. John 13, 13. You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. But if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. I have given you an example. Do you know what the word disciple even means? It means one who follows closely, one who walks in the footsteps of whoever that teacher or master is. So by definition, if this is an example of Jesus, and if we do not have service incorporated in how we approach the world, we're not following the example. We, by definition, are not disciples. Service is part of it. Service is part of it. And here's the thing with service we need to start with. The service is incorporated, but why? Because it's not convenient. It's not always the best for you or I. It's, uh, it's not always something we feel like doing, so why do it? Well, we started with the first answer, answer is this. It's embedded in the Christian path. First thing is, it is our calling. Service is simply part of a relationship where God is involved. If we're visible, godly, and we're in relationships that have the God element in it, and it should if we're in that relationship, then service will follow in that. It's our calling. Why? What other reasons? Why serve? How about this? Because you are not really serving another person. You are serving God himself. Serving God himself. Jesus wanted to get this point across in Matthew 25, 35. He's gone through a long dissertation of who the real deal is, and he ends like this, right in the nitty-gritty of where people live. For I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Verse 40 sums it up. Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Assuredly, I say, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. If you're following these verses uh, via your uh, uh, guide uh, sheets, you notice that there's two highlighted words there in least and brethren because they're very operative phrases. Brethren can mean, as we think, literally, join, you know, from the same womb. However, it can also mean figuratively, near or remote. This is the Greek definition from it. It can mean near or remote. Least is another interesting word. It means least, sure, but in size or amount or in dignity, etc. How many ways can somebody be the least? The least dignified, the least lovable, the least powerful, the least attractive. There's a lot of ways a person can be the least. When opportunity brings somebody our way and we're helping them, that may be a person we're helping with very little self-dignity. 
and maybe someone who has very little appreciation for what you're doing, and maybe someone who has very little social skills, but it doesn't matter because when we're doing it, you're not doing it primarily even for that person. You are doing it to God himself. Even the very least. You may feel sometimes as, as we do what we're supposed to do, whether it be in pantry or the neighbor across the, the, the backyard or whatever, as we're doing it, you say, man, why do I even bother with that person? They don't appreciate it. They, they don't even see, well, start here, is because you're not doing it to them alone, even though they are the least appreciative or the least lovable or the least likely to reciprocate. You are doing it onto God himself. That's one reason we serve, because as we're doing kindness, the kindness is to God himself through the person. We do service because it's a natural sign of life. This is an important one because we get this all mixed up sometimes. See, uh, we can get it wrong where, you know what, we'll do, do social activism. We'll go out and do uh, kind things because that's what we're supposed to do. Or we do them because in the back of our mind we think, if I do this, I'll be pleasing God and I'll have another uh, jewel in my crown. Or uh, if I don't do this, God will be mad at me. But that's not not the way it works. It's a sign of life. You breathe not because that's what living people do. It's because you're alive, you have to breathe. It's part of you. Giving or service becomes part of the instinct of the person who's filled with God. It is something we practice and do, practice and do. Uh, we know we're getting off kilter when that service becomes an end in itself. Isn't it great? This church is validated because we go out and do all kinds of good things. We're in trouble. That is not why we are here. We are here because we're the body of Christ. And because we're the body of Christ, then we go out and do things. Entirely different. We don't try to please God. We do because we love God, because we are filled with God. Jesus, Matthew 7, 16, you will know them by their fruits, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes, figs from thistles? 20 sums it up. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. It is proof. Let me tell you this. In your relationship with us as a church, if we should be in a point where it really doesn't matter the needs around us, if we're, well, I feel bad about that, but that's somebody else's problem, and we're indifferent, by their fruits you will know them. We better step back and have a really serious conversation with God because the sign of life is not in us. By their fruits, you will know them. We serve because that's the way the Christian is moved. That is part of life. That's a sign of life. Okay, here we, we've gotten this far. We've talked about relationship. Service is incorporated in attitude and heart. Trying to look out for the welfare of others that comes to the Christian heart. And we might have to learn, and, and you know, we're coming from selfish backgrounds or just never really concerned. God wells that up in our hearts, but then we have to practice it and it becomes rooted. But let's say we get that far. We know that if we're not serving, then there's a problem. We've got this far. We know we will serve, but then how do we serve? How do we serve? One of the greatest verses in Scripture, the only verse that I can think of that tells you, you want to know what pure religion is, <laughs> this is it. Do you want to know what undefiled religion is? This is it. Do you want to know what God considers a real religion? Here it is. James 1.27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Once again, you see a number of operative phrases, four key phrases that are underlined there. Start with unspotted. In the context, how is one unspotted? We have a faith, and I'll just put this over to your own mental inventory. How many ways have you known people to tarnish the Christian faith or tarnish their own reputation as a Christian? So many ways. 
You know, we were even in here talking um, with uh, uh, Pastor Bob Petty, who, you know, was telling us about the greenhouse model, why the greenhouse model, mentoring interns, mentoring uh, up-and-coming pastors or whatever. Why? Because they got great training, and they know what they're doing. The trouble is in integrity, is that there is a high rate in every denomination of both burnout and moral failure. That's the problem with being unspotted. So easy. So easy. Whether it's you or me, even for the well-intended, all we have to do is try and do a God thing, but not God's way. Happens to uh, pastors, you know. There, there is a lady in the congregation who's having marriage problems, and, and, and he just gets too close, and the next thing, something wrong is going on. In youth groups, you can hear of stories here and there where, you know, a lot of times the youth minister's not that much older than the people he's leading and these kids. And there may be that one special girl a little old for her age, a little uh, old, lo older looking for her age, and then, and then something happens between them that shouldn't be happening. Blurring the lines in ministry, just one way. Compromise is another way. There's all kinds of ways we can spot ourselves. Context is important. No matter what the Christian ministry or the operation or the endeavor, keep this in mind, is that the end never justifies the means. The end never justifies the means. To end up in some godly objective by doing it completely in a way God does not approve wins you nothing. It accomplishes nothing. It is God's way to God's end, unspotted by the world. But it goes uh, even further than that. In the spotting, it can hurt other people. We are told, Matthew 10, 16, Jesus, sending out his disciples for the first time into a culture that's uh, ready to tear them apart. He puts it this way, Behold, I send you out as sheep into the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Who are the wolves? You know what? Sometimes the wolves are the people that you got to watch out for, but not necessarily. The wolves could be circumstances that you better be really on your game when you get in those circumstances. It could be worldviews like we're talking about in the Truth Project. There's a lot of wolves out there, and you're told to be two things if you want to stay unspotted. One is be wise as serpents. Just don't be stupid. <laughs> you know, even common sense uh, in itself is not all that common, is it? Just be wise in what you're doing. It's another way of saying no matter what you do, do it God's way. Harmless as doves. Harmless how so? Because when we do have some type of catastrophic failure as Christians, it's not just you. It's a ripple effect. It'll be those in your family, those close to you, those who are watching you as a Christian. It's going to harm a lot of people. Be wise and then be harmless in the full sense of the word. So we start there, undefiled, be unspotted. But let's get into the, to the operative words here, the things that we're doing. Very interesting. Visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Three things going on there, right? Visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Visit in itself is an interesting word. In the original Greek, inspect, select, go see, and to relieve. That sets up a whole picture. It's like you're out there actually with an eye out for people, selecting, and maybe in the way that there's somebody God brought across my path who needs relief in some way. And so it goes way beyond, well, I'll go over to Carol and Ron's and visit them and have a cup of tea. It's not talking in that respect. It is talking about an active type of relief, widows and orphans. Literal? Sure but also figurative. Will it, widows and orphans, they embodied powerlessness, especially in Christ's time. If you were a widow and you lost your husband, that's just the way it was. You lost your social identity, in effect. As an orphan, your identity as a child came through your parents. If you have no parents, essentially you have no social identity. You are a, a non-entity. You are powerless, powerless, powerless. 
Well, okay, so we're talking about powerless people, but how so? Well, it says powerless in their need or in their trouble. Another interesting word, you know what it means literally? The literal meaning in the Greek is this, pressure. Pressure. Not just, um, you know, where do people feel pressure in life? Where are they powerless in life? Well, you know, when you read that at first, you think, well, okay, we're talking those who have no social power to look out for themselves. Could be. Those who are financially powerless could be. But think of all the ways under some type of pressure people are powerless. They might be the richest person you know. They might be famous. You can be powerless. People can be powerless in so many ways. Powerless to deal with their anger. Powerless to deal with their fear. Powerless. You ever know anybody that, man, they just seem to make the same mistake over and over and over. They just don't seem to get it. There's so many ways we can be powerless. So we put it all together. Here's real Christianity. Real Christianity is having an instinct in life where we select or go see those who are powerless under some pressure in life as in the place of Christ to do what we can to relieve that pressure. Relieving the pressure for those who are powerless to relieve it. Wow. That opens up a lot more than just visiting literally orphans and widows, doesn't it? Even as that's included. That is a way we serve. We serve by being the model of Christ. The model of Christ. I still, a little kid came up with the best definition for this yet. You know, you, everybody or most people maybe heard this story if you've been around church. One of those stories that cycled about the little kid who was so afraid in the middle of a thunderstorm at night. And the parent tells them, you know, don't worry, God's here. And they said, well, I know God's here, but I need God with skin on. You know, I need someone I can see. Ephesians 5.1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offer, offering and sacrifice to God. Have you ever been God with skin on to someone? Is there anyone you can think of in your life? You say, you know, that person, maybe that if I never knew an honest to goodness Christian in my entire life, well, that person was. That person was. That's our goal, is to be the real deal. Let me give you, uh, just to back up this, this whole concept a little bit, one of the most confusing verses you find in Scripture. Jesus is under attack, literally, from Pharisees and, 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 and church leader, or, um, synagogue leaders and such. And in his argument, he makes a very, this is a very Jewish statement. Uh, it, it, it appealed to the Old Testament, and so it's very hard for us to understand. John 10, 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are God's? Wow, that's kind of like, really, what is that all about? They were going to stone him because he, was, he said he was the son of God. He says, doesn't scripture say you are God's? Uh, and you go, well, what could that possibly mean? Well, start with this. The statement is made with a small g, not a big g. Jesus was quoting from Psalms 82, 6, which was quoting or referring back all the way to Exodus. So he went back a few thousand years, and Psalms went back even further a few thousand. Exodus 21, 6. Uh, reads like this, Then his master shall bring his servant to the judges. Now, the, what we're getting at here is the word judges. The word for judge used there was Elohim. That sound familiar? If you know any words in Hebrew as we throw them around every now and then, you know the word Elohim. It means God. But when it's used here, it's done with a small e. <laughs> small God, small g. The reference to the Old Testament really is something that is core to Christianity. Way back in Exodus, a concept that is core to Christianity. See, we call ourselves Christians, which means little Christs with a little c. <laughs> We're in effect called to go out. We're supposed to be literally filled with the Holy Spirit. We are supposed to be 
God with skin on. But we're God with a little g. We're that reflection where if somebody sees you, that is seeing God. That's what we're called to be. Not because you are God yourself, because of what feels and impacts you as a person. You know, people used to wear those little what would Jesus do bracelets. Well, in fact, you're supposed to be the what would Jesus do bracelet. We are called to be the visible form of God working in this world. If they don't see God in you, who believe you are a Christian, who, who, who have a living relationship with God, where else will they see it? Who else will they see it from? We're visible in the relationships. And if we are truly visible as God in relationships, what will it look like? It will look like service. And that's how service comes down. Here's the thing. Are we done then? You know what? There I was. I went out. I was visible. And, and relationships formed. Not mercenary relationships. Not like, you know what? I'm going to become friends with Josh just so I can tell him all about Jesus. You know, if that's why we build relationships, you know what? I wouldn't blame Josh. Just once I said anything, he'd say, well, hey, you were planning this all the time. Get out of here. You know, you're duping me. No, that's, if we are friends with people in the relationships, because God so loved the world, we're friends with them simply because they're human beings for themselves. However, in the context of who we are, it naturally comes down to Christ. And when it does, there is at some point in the gospel where things need to be articulated in some way. You know, at some point, gee, you know, that Rick Miller is such a nice guy. And I said, I don't know why he's a nice guy. He just really is. And Rick never lets me know of what has impacted his life. I know the world has some nice people in it. I just don't know why. Some point in proclamation, does that really come down to that? Does God really want us to ever speak out? Mark 16, 15, and he said to them, this is not just preachers, he's talking to Christians in general, his disciples, go into all the world, everywhere that you go, and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Two words in here that are very important. Of course, a gospel is important because gospel <laughs> means good news, right? There's one problem in the world in general. It has a problem distinguishing between old and timeless. See, I have some old shoes in my closet. I got shoes older than my kids. They're hanging somewhere in the back of my closet. That's old. But scripture is timeless. What it said has always been true. It never gets old because it's timeless. We believe in timeless stuff all the time. You know, when, when man first walked on this earth, they needed to breathe oxygen. That's still timeless. I don't know if anybody says, we've been doing that for so long. Let's breathe something else and try and stay alive. It's not going to happen. People have been breathing some other stuff, but it's not helping them stay alive. Oxygen is timeless, is it not? The gospel is timeless for life. It says preach. Well, hmm, what does that really mean? Well, the word really doesn't mean what we think like standing in front of a pulpit. It means to herald as a town crier. Everybody's seen a, some movie from Dickens or somewhere. We all know what a town crier is. Hear ye, hear ye, bing, bing, bing with the bell or whatever shouting from the rooftops. The idea is that it is a very public way of speaking. I'm not saying we get in people's faces, but the point is, yes, we are called to articulate at some point. We are called to communicate. Let me ask you a question, just a little challenge. Somebody finally in a relationship says, what's all like God thing about? I heard that word saved thrown around. How do, what does that mean? How do you do it? Would you know what to say? Would you have an approach? How do you explain quickly without stumbling all over your feet and your mouth and your 
head and everything else and explain succinctly before the person glazes over and walks away. Well, there's a few things that just in that little life hack, if I may say, there's a few ways approaches, and we can't go to formula, but boy, it's nice to have a model at least to go by. Let's, let's take a poll. Has any, anyone in here heard of the Roman road? Just curious. Okay, there's like three of us, okay. <laughs> the rest just don't want to say one way or the other. Roman road is basically just a few passages in Romans uh, depending on what version, anything from three to, I think, six different verses, that gives you the whole theology of Christianity in six verses. From all sinners all the way to him who calls on the name of the Lord. Uh, anybody could memorize it, at least, the, you know, which verses they are. Roman road. Uh, another way that's a little bit simplistic in formula, but uh, still a good approach, the ABC explanation. Don't know if you've heard of that. Basically, it comes down to admit, believe, and confess. Used a lot in, say, like Pentecostal churches. But it's a model. We, we have a sinner's prayer we put in the bulletin all the time. Not a formula, but at least a model, a principle to go by. Uh, both of these are on the learn more. If you've never heard of the Roman road, or if you've never heard of the ABC, Click on the Learn More button. You can, you can look at both of them. Bottom line is, though, at this, at some point, we need to proclaim. We're visible in the right context. Relationships in the right context. We have credibility. But at some point in the service, after some point in there, some point, not all relationships, but many come down to that. There's a point of proclamation. You know what? You know why we so seldom to get there? It's nothing new. Paul had the same problem. Rome. What a city. It was like downtown Indy or Chicago or anywhere else. Bunch of ethnic groups, lots of different thinking. You think you've got the way? Man, are you a bigot? Are you narrow-minded? All kinds of things. So not surprising, when Paul's writing a message, he says this, he's writing the letter to the Romans. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, Greek or Jew. It is the power of God to salvation. Shame. Interesting word, isn't it? Ashamed, shame. Looked it up in the dictionary, just an English one. And uh, it said a lot of things that, um, that we would think, sure. Painful feeling arising from uh, the consciousness. Uh, something because maybe of dishonor, uh, improper, or ridiculous. Let's stop at that word. This culture, under fire, once again, one of the reasons for even doing the Truth Project, man, it is just one long answer to this one. Have you ever, admit to yourself, you don't, I'm not saying raise a hand or anything else, have you ever felt ridiculous in a, a group or against an argument? There's a lot of smart people who are violently against Scripture. Have you even for a moment, somewhere in the back of your mind, felt a little bit ridiculous? Enough so that you decided not to open your mouth. Or as they said in the first uh, uh, service, well, maybe not ridiculous in, in my faith per se, but that I was going to come across as ridiculous. Well, in effect, is that not being ashamed of the gospel? Let me share three timeless truths, not of the gospel, but about the gospel. One is this, it is always completely true. There is nothing of the gospel of Christ that is uh, outdated, expired. It is completely true all the time. It is always completely true. It is never popular. We say, oh, the good old days of when they were writing Scripture. Oh, no, man, you didn't want to live back then. It was dangerous stuff to believe in Christ back in that day. It has never been popular. Uh, 
Well, what about the church culture in America, you know, when back in the 1800s or whatever? No, there was all kinds of traditional Christianity, but the real gospel has never been popular. So it's completely true. It's never been popular. But here comes number three. People die without it. People die without it. Without Christ, he says, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. And without the Father, it's eternal death. Permanent. So here we are as Christians in this VRSP thing where on one hand we suffer discomfort to share in, in some different degrees, but on the other hand, people go to eternal death without it. Our discomfort, their death, even if they don't accept. But there we are, we're balancing these all the time. Our discomfort, their death. Our discomfort, our, their death. Well, in proclamation, maybe the one thing that puts us over the hump, if we can get there, if we can be there, is to really, really believe that the gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe it? Not only for your faith, but how you will end up living life in front of others. Do we really believe the gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation? Even if the world doesn't. The need, see, even if the world puts it down, even, even if we run into problems, it doesn't make it any less true. It doesn't make it any less urgent. Are we willing to go that far? I'm not saying get in people's faces and do it because it's your duty. I'm saying through the natural progress of relation, service, at some point, articulating exactly why you are who you are. <laughs> 